Referring geographical feature. You're tardy and you're dripping. I'm not a doctor. Growing up, Disney movies were always a highlight of my childhood. To sit here and name every single movie that truly made my weeks better after school could take years. But there was always one movie that stuck out more than any other. A film that I would watch almost daily once my parents purchased me the DVD. Max Keeble's Big Move, a mostly forgotten about, not so serious film that for some reason has left a bigger impact on me more so than most other films have. I said most. I said most! Anyway, I figured that if we're going to start going over some of the Disney classics and other forgotten gems that I find interesting, as well as this to me is considered my 100k subscriber special, thank you guys so much by the way, why not celebrate firstly with my favorite, Cax Meebles Mig Boov. No, wait. But let's keep that between you and me, okay? Huge shout out to Loudhouse Fan 9 for guessing today's video correct. If you want to participate, make sure to follow me on Twitter. Make sure to hit that like button if you want to see more weird or obscure Disney movies talked about here on the channel and all learn how to do a reverse front flip. Isn't that just a back flip? The film starts off with our main hero, Max, who is the best paperboy around who must dodge and evade the evil ice cream man played by Jamie Kennedy. Funny story about Malibu's Most Wanted over here. My elementary school gym teacher always told us that her cousin was Jamie Jamie Kennedy even had the same last name and a picture of them to prove it, but when she would always promise one day to have him stop by to say hi, she would say the school wouldn't approve him coming by. I have no reason to not believe her, but it always felt like there was an excuse. And while this was like the height of his career, I would say he was known for more mature and risque content, so I don't think kids in elementary school really cared about it too much. Except for me, this was the evil ice cream man for goodness sake, and I always felt let down by these empty promises, kind of like my light goal promises. In this opening sequence, we see a Daring cream mobile on bike chase through some suburban streets as the evil ice cream man tries to for some reason eliminate the existence of Max Keeble and sadly takes down Tony Hawk in the process. Ah, nothing says early 2000s like a random sports celebrity cameo. Gotta love it. This happens at one point. I will defeat you. My complicated fighting move. Nice shot! And the chase ends in this sick, larger-than-life bike jump off a tow truck landing right in front of the girl he likes yard, delivering her newspaper, and all before he gets to kiss her, here comes the son of the mask to shoot her right in the face. Mint chocolate chip style. I'm more of a cotton candy flavor guy, you can give me cookie dough on a good day, but hey, what can I say? I'm just different like that. You're not that special. Anyway, turns out it was all a dream, and it was the first day of junior high, and Max here is full of... Attitude. Ah, the slang of the time, where almost any word could be made to say sound cool like uh, drumpin'. I don't know what it means, I just made it up. But it could have been something back then. We meet his parents, and yes, that is Mr. McGuire cosplaying as a dancing lobster, but we don't need to dwell on that. And speaking of dancing lobsters, from Amanda Show fame at the time, Josh Peck gets introduced to us as one of Max's best friends, as well as Megan. Megan! No, not that Megan. She's kind of this geeky band girl, and Josh's character, Robe, is... Well, he just wears a robe? He also has no concept of germs. That is so gosh dang disgusting. Approaching the school, we get introduced to the overall antagonist of the movie, Principal Jindrake. This man makes Thanos look like a gentle soul. He hates kids, he hates animals, he hates literally anything that doesn't align with his overall plan of fudging school budgetary numbers in order to build a giant football stadium. His other aspiration is to use this to leverage his chances at becoming a superintendent. We also get shown the bullies of the school through the fear-mongering stories told by Reese from Malcolm in the Middle here and his friend who is credited as yearbook photographer. We learn about Troy McGinty, who every day wears a shirt with his victim's name on it to show the school who he's going to pick on that day. Also, yes, yeah, speaking of Twilight again, he's in that. We learn that his first victim is Max Keeble, but why? Out of any student, did he choose Max to be the first of the school year's first victim? Find out shortly. We're not there yet. Jeez, relax there, James. Also, Lil Romeo's here as Lil Romeo for some odd reason, but that's okay. He'll have his own show on Nickelodeon soon enough. The principal makes a special announcement requiring all the students to show up for an assembly that is mandatory, and when he finishes his announcement, he doesn't end the broadcast, embarrassing himself in front of the entire school. A running theme, as you'll soon come to find out. Turner and Hooch here is crushing on the science teacher as we learn about animal pheromones and how they attract and affect animal behavior. Okay, fine. Now I'll tell you about Troy. Him and Max used to be friends when they were a bit younger until one birthday party featuring the popular in-universe children's TV character, McGoogles. A Scottish frog with the catchiest theme song imaginable. McGoogles is my name. I like a swampy bog. It's time to play a game of what your favorite Highland Frog. Oh, uh, looks like I didn't turn off my recording either. <laughs> Great. Jordan Cringe. So Troy was actually scared of the frog and has a full on freak out at that birthday party back then, especially when Max's dad comes in dressed as McGoogles, completely traumatizing him in front of all the other kids. And from that day on, it was family no more. Family. <laughs>
So when running into him in the hallway, it was time to bully him. Literally taking him outside, holding him late from the assembly by tossing him in some mud and then the dumpster, which can I just say, this may be the actual, no joke here, grossest gag inducing dumpster I have ever seen in my entire life. I feel like I could literally 4D smell every individual item in here. Hope you like lasagna. The assembly itself was about Jim Drake saying the current superintendent, Nebworth, who was a star football player, is making a visit to the school in which Jim Drake wants to impress him in hopes of becoming next in line for superintendent. We meet a few exchange students here that are supposed to be star athlete players for the school, and okay, these are full grown adults here. I mean, look at this guy especially. Now, I don't know much about football. I had no clue if this was a cameo from some real athletes. I mean, we just had Tony Hawk earlier, so who knows? But after double checking, the most I know about them is that they're Slav 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Who knows, maybe they do play football too, but we never see it happen in the movie, so who cares? Thanks to Max walking into the assembly late, stealing the attention away from the principal's presumptuous presentation covered in garbage, he's now the principal's number one concern. Afterwards, he cleans himself up with the sprinklers and dries off thanks to the janitor, who you'll come to love as the best character in the movie. Back to mid-Malcolm and yearbook kid, we hear a tale of the other main school bully, Dobbs. Meet this 12 to 13 year old interested in cryptocurrency. Here, played by Orlando Bloom of <laughs> No, that, that's not correct. Orlando Brown of That's So Raven fame. <laughs> Maybe this stock market whiz kid might suggest Keeble token is going to the moon before he dumps it right as everyone invests and tweets out saying that this is not financial advice. He bullies kids by taking their money as investments as he once was apparently a millionaire at the age of 10 before losing it all and now his main goal is to make it all back. Max ends up taking band class so he could be near the girl from his dream who's a little bit older than him but has slightly given him the time of day a couple times here and there but in this scene is shown to be a really snooty brat to other people like his friend Megan. After the first day of school is over, Max heads over to the neighboring animal shelter that he likes to visit and help out at, especially for his monkey friend Tad, and he is oddly tailed by the principal for reasons we'll find out soon. Max is told that the animal shelter is actually closing down at the end of the week as someone has purchased the lot for the shelter. Hmm, I wonder if this has any connection to do with anything suspicious we just talked about moments ago. And I bet you're wondering, why is this movie called Max Keeble's Big Move? Well, for two reasons. The first is that when he gets home, his parents tell him that they have to move to Chicago for his dad's work and are leaving this upcoming Friday. When telling his friends, Robe tells them to watch out for carjackers, which this is the moment as a kid where I found out that carjackers were a thing and had a fear as a kid that at any moment when in a car, whether it be in a parking lot, a red light, or a stop sign, someone could just walk over and steal your car from you. As a kid, how was I supposed to know, you know? There was never a prominent reason for my parents to have to sit me down and tell me this information, so thanks Josh Peck for doing what my parents couldn't and making sure that I'm always cautious and alert of my surroundings in a car. The next day we learn the origins of the evil evil ice cream man and his grudge against the sixth grader here. Come to find out that Max found a cockroach in his ice cream once and his mother called the health inspector on the ice cream man. This has affected him and his business and now he has this hatred of this little Keeble dude. Later at school we see Keeble have his worst day yet, starting off with the principal confronting Keeble about him and his friend's efforts to save the animal shelter, explaining that he is personally bulldozing the land to make room for the football stadium. Also Troy McGinty goes after Robe encasing him in a display enclosure in front of the whole school, where Max Max has to go and save him by letting him out, thus ruining Troy's plans. So Troy does the whole swirly thing on Max, you know, the thing that you always got scared of bullies doing to you, but seriously, if you actually had a swirly happen to you, please let me know because I'd never seen it happen to any kid ever. I think it's just a myth perpetuated by shows and movies. But because of that, when he returns to class late, the teacher gives him a writing assignment as punishment, and when she notes that she wants it done by Friday, he realizes that, hey, I ain't even gonna be here Friday. I'll be in Chicago. And everything starts clicking in his head. He's leaving anyway. There'll be no real consequences that he has to face. And this is the moment where Max Keeble snaps. He starts causing a scene in the class, ending with him standing on the teacher's desk, kicking a globe, and citing a student uprising in the class before grumpingly walking out. What, my made up 2000 slang word not as cool as I think it is in my head? Fine, fair enough. Now here we set in motion the other meaning of Max Keeble's big move. He's about to make some serious moves on everyone who has ever wronged him or is causing wrongdoing. The targets are set. The evil ice cream man, Troy McGinty, Dobbs, and of course, Principal Gin Drake. He sets up every little intricate detail of taking everyone down and relays to his friends that he will be the one who they will go after, but he won't be there when they try to. So Max wins and the bullies lose, right?
Back at school, Max lights a fire under the burner already placed between Dobbs and the evil ice cream man. Where the trio steal an item from each of them, Dobbs is handheld in one case and the evil ice cream man's coil from the truck that keeps the ice cream frozen. Next, we find Troy about to bully another victim. Shortly after scaring him away, he opens his locker only to be greeted by the McGoogle song until he closes it. And every time he opens it after the song starts playing again, and again, and again, because on the other side of the locker, in a classroom, is Max hitting play on a boombox, replaying the song over and over. And all the froggy PTSD comes flashing back at Troy. Also, the day for the superintendent coming to visit is fastly approaching, so everything must be in top-notch perfect order to impress him. And once again, during the announcements, the principal forgets to turn his camera off properly, embarrassing himself in front of the whole school once more. Robe distracts the science teacher so Max can actually steal some bottles of the pheromones from earlier for part of his plan. At the same time, Dobbs realizes his handheld is missing, and the ice cream man realizes that his product is starting to melt. As the plans are slowly taking motion, Max gets to have a touching moment with his friends here, about how this will be the last few days that they will have together, and maybe that he will find friends in Chicago just like them. It's a sweet way to look about moving away as a kid. As someone who moved several times at various ages throughout middle school and high school, not being able to truly grasp everything and seeing the world in a smaller bubble, it seemed like you would be losing your friends, but now thanks to social media developing more, luckily I've been able to keep several lifelong friendships because of that. But in the moment, and when I was younger, it did feel like a final goodbye and you never really know how to say goodbye as a kid. They are also planning one last hangout as a going away party which symbolizes their friendship through the years and to create one final memory together. Max and his father have a big talk about the move as Max doesn't see where his dad is coming from and relays his newfound mentalities about standing up for yourself and not being a pushover, as his father seems to his boss. And I like this added dynamic between where parents and kids can differ seeing how a move comes to be, and the viewpoints of a kid not understanding or a parent not relating to the kid's feelings. Now, we ain't talking about an Oscar-worthy performance or dialogue here, but to have these kind of discussions in a Disney film I'm sure helped some people out there understand the conversation better as it had for me. Later that night, the trio break into the school after hours to mess around in the principal's office, put the pheromones in his breath spray, and find out about the misappropriation of school funds hurting the other teachers and classes taught, like we see here in band class with the space being also doubled as a storage room for the football equipment. The next day at school, Max opens his jacket in front of everyone to show that his shirt says Troy McGinty. Just like Troy McGinty. That's such a Troy McGinty move if I must say. And here, we have what could be recut into a horror movie, editing is everything style, where Troy is cornered and left in the dark with Max in a McGoogle outfit, the same one from Troy's childhood trauma. In fact, let's just do that. I pound on kids. That's what I do. That's what I do. It may bring up some unpleasant memories. But I think you'll find it helpful in the end. Ah! I went about all this the wrong way. What are you gonna do about it, huh? I'm so scared. <laughs> You should be. I am my muggles But I still don't see how this is gonna help save the animal shelter. It's all part of the plan. Stand together and make our school a better place for everyone. This can't happen to me. You know what they call me out there? The Magoogler? <laughs> it's time to play a game of with your favorite item for. All this literally sent him into therapy. I have no joke for this. Kind of messed up there, Max, not gonna lie. While the principal is setting up things for the superintendent, you can see why I love the janitor so much. Just the perfect character. And right before the superintendent does arrive, we can see some foreshadowing here of the principal spraying some of the breast spray in his mouth that has the animal pheromones in it. So naturally, next door to the school, you can hear all the animals start to freak out from said pheromones, so you can start seeing part of Max's plan come together. Upon arrival, we can already see that Nebworth already not really enjoying being here or around Jindrake at all. And Jindrake 
Zurich also lies to Nebworth about how they are able to afford the stadium, as even Nebworth knows that there's no way in the budget to afford the stadium. But throughout the tour, we see how Jindrake quickly disguises truths about how different aspects of why the library is small or where the new computers that were ordered went, all while being attacked by a squirrel from spraying more spray. You're gonna love my nuts. Robe hands Dobbs handheld to the evil ice cream man that says meet him at the junkyard later, and we see Dobbs get an instant message regarding the coil to bring it to the junkyard as well. But we will return to that after we have what I think is one of the most undisputed, iconic, messiest food fight scenes of all time put to film. Right before Jin Drake brings the superintendent to the cafeteria to show him the honorary setup that they put together, Max starts a food fight between two people, causing everyone to get in this all-out war of food. Tubas with mustard, teachers getting attacked in the trash cans, and of course, the tarnishing of all the decorations that were put up. Yo, not the camera, those aren't cheap, you know? How would you know? You don't even use one for your videos anymore. During the food fight, the principal and the superintendent walk in as he says, this is my gift to you, and oh boy, what a gift he gets. Not only does he look like his school is not ran well, but Tad, the monkey from earlier, comes running in from the pheromones and knocks Jindrake into some pudding and mashed potato. I hope that's pudding. Jumping on him over and over, knocking his face repeatedly into it, Nebworth leaves disappointed and Jindrake is made a fool once again. Now at the junkyard, the evil ice cream man and Dobbs meet. We get this great joke about the handheld. I want my handheld. You want me to hold your hand? No! And they both end up destroying each other's property while screaming at one another. All while in the background, Max lifts up the ice cream truck with a crane, which he shouldn't be operating in general, even if he did become a famous YouTube vlogger, and literally drops it on top of them. Thus crushing them, cutting to black, the movie ends, Max Keeble got his revenge, moves to Chicago, and life is fine for everyone. Okay, that's not what happened, but it would have been a pretty shocking end to the film if it did. The truck just dumps the soupy melted ice cream on them both and Max escapes the scene. Then every villain realizes who was really behind everything now turning their attention towards Keeble, who has destroyed a school cafeteria as well as an assault on the principal, led to the destruction of property and personal items as well as personally destroying large portions of a work vehicle, and sent a person into a full-on shock from childhood trauma resulting in counseling to help fix it. So you tell me, who is the real villain here, hmm? Now heading to his going away party, the girl from school he has a crush on stops him and invites him to hang out and get some milkshakes with her and her friends. Leading to him full on milkshaking it up, dancing on the table with her, getting hyped up by Lil Romeo. All while his friends waited for him and find out where he is only to be saddened to see where his priorities lied in the end. Again, who is the real villain here? Now it's Friday, the big day of the move, and all the consequences foregoed. Only one problem with that. He's not moving? Turns out his dad took his advice from earlier about sticking up for yourself and doing what's best for the family. I, I don't know about if giving up your job to start a new job on your own and be your own boss was the answer just yet, my dude, but hey, whatever floats your kayak. So now everyone in the school assumes that he has moved and all the bullies take out their aggressions directly on his friends and the principal is going to enact stricter rules in the school and still bulldoze the animal shelter down. So everything he thought would be okay was not. Max spends the whole day hiding around the school with the saint of a janitor letting him lie low and giving him the best words of wisdom he needs to hear. Any kid can make a mess. It takes a man to clean it up. So he does the right thing and starts to clean up the mess that he made. He takes over the school broadcast, apologizing to his friends, telling the bullies to see him after the bell rings to face him head on. And before he gets to finish speaking, the principal barges in this time, confirming the turn off of the camera and sternly threatens him and the future students with any similar intentions in the future. Max tells him he knows all all about the budget fudging, and when Jindrake's back is turned, he turns on the camera secretly as Elliot here exposes himself and mocks the teachers of the school, the janitor, as well as fully admits to the budgetary fraud in which he has committed live to the whole school, by the way. The bulldozer arrives as the final threat, saying he didn't save the animal shelter after all, then proceeding to lock him up in the janitor's closet so he couldn't stop him in time. Luckily though, Max escapes just in the nick of time to face the bullies head on. Jindrake goes to check on him, notices that he's missing and the janitor swiftly locks him in the closet. Like an animal. Ironic. Again, best character. Keeble faces the bullies head on as his friends jump in with the greatest Josh Peck entrance ever, finally shedding his robe and leading in the marching band, playing a cover of We're Not Gonna Take It as everyone fully surrounds the bullies, as if it's the on your left moment with all the portals from Avengers and telling them that they're not gonna take it. You know, see, it actually makes sense why they're playing that song, because they actually, they, that's what they tell the bullies. They all grab them and attempt to throw them in the dumpster, but right before, Max delivers a speech about being no better than them and that 
that they can all live in harmony. And thanks to poorly wording what to do with them, they're still proceeded to be dropped into the dumpster. Also, Elliot escapes his captivity. Man, that's just not a well-protected lockup, is it? Side note, you can also see the shadow of the person on the crew who started pushing open the door. And when the girl he really likes comes up to him and invites him to hang out, Max rejects the girl for his friends. And right before a really sweet moment between Max and Megan, Jin Drake rams the bulldozers through the parking lot and into the animal shelter. Max flips onto an ostrich and the fight for the shelter begins. But of course, some breath spray never hurt, right? Oh yeah, pheromones. Oops. Max uses his paperboy powers to open a gate of animals that chase and attack Jin Drake down the road. And that's basically where they cut it to say the day is safe. Now that didn't finish everything off right then and there. Once everything went public and made headlines, the principal was fired and a new era has begun. Except the evil ice cream man is still not happy about him nearly destroying his vehicle, his business, and well, well, his sanity. All of this taking place within the first week of school, mind you, literally five days. And all of this big mess happened. But at the end of the day, I guess not moving was the best move of all or something. That just sounded like a nice way to end that. Max Keeble isn't top tier cinema, not even close, but this film has everything in it that made it a personal favorite childhood film from good morals, the strength of friendship, standing up for what's right, being kind and compassionate to animals, as well as moving sucks. Have you ever moved? It's not fun. It's a long, tedious process, and no one has a good time. I love the movie for what it means to me. Like I said, clearly it's not great. It obviously is not talked about in the higher regard of Disney films, and it really just stands as a representation of the time it's from. But all that being said, it still is my favorite Disney film from that time. I loved coming back and revisiting it now just as much as I loved watching it almost daily as a kid. I still quote things from it today like, slip me that biscuit, ooh, that's a hot one, among many others that sit in the far reaches of my memory. The fact that the McGoo Google's song is still something I know by heart and sing to myself when no one's around is a testament to my fondness of this film. I now realize that I just admitted to singing the Mac Google song alone to myself and that's the saddest thing I've ever said. Those were my thoughts and memories with Max Keeble's big move. And since you heard mine, now I would love to hear yours down below in the comments. Is this a movie you even remember? Did you enjoy it? Do you just downright not like it? How dare you? Regardless, please feel free to share with me down below. I appreciate you all checking out this video. It means a lot to me that you choose to spend a few moments of your day here with me. Again, thank you so much for 100,000 subscribers. I am eternally grateful. Hit that like button if you want to see more videos like this, as it truly helps out the video. And I want to cover more Disney shows and original movies movies, so I hope to see you back here for more of those soon. Subscribe to be part of my journey through movies and television and how these films and shows affected my life from the past and present. I'll be back soon with another video, but until then, later.